Well, a very good afternoon to everybody. Um, as the last uh, scheduled speaker of the day, uh, Tim Rochester is my name, um, I want to first of all uh, say a big thank you to Gene for the honor of uh, asking me down from Philadelphia, or up from Philadelphia rather, um, today to, uh, to speak on this occasion and for organizing uh, such a fitting and glorious tribute to Douglas's memory uh, in collaboration with David Way. I think we uh, owe them both a huge round of applause for you. <laughs> The microphone needs to be closer. Okay, thank you. Ah, uh, it's not on. All right. Okay, that must be better. Okay, terrific. Well, I met Douglas uh, just two, just over two years ago. Actually, it was in the spring of 2010, and I met him through the channel that um, apparently many people uh, did in the last two years. Uh, that would be Facebook. Um, and um, I would like to tell the whole sort of story of how that came across because this was in the days before Facebook lights were ubiquitous, and they actually still. Uh, where, where something When you saw somebody had liked an item in which you appeared, in this case it was a photograph um, of a rehearsal, um, you really took, uh, paid attention. And for me, um, <coughs> this was a surprise. It was a rehearsal uh, of my arrangement of Piazzolas Maria de Buenos Aires. I was rehearsing it with Mimi Stillman's group in Philadelphia, uh, where I live, uh, Dolce Suono, and um, we were preparing um, it, the Curtis Institute of Music for a, a concert of this. And a narrator was involved called Gerardo Razzoni, who's also a fabulous tango dancer. He's well into his 70s now, uh, but still dancing very actively in the Philadelphia scene. And he had brought a dance partner with him to, uh, just for fun, in the rehearsals when he wasn't required to speak, to dance tango along with us. So here we had a Curtis studio with this impromptu tango going on in it. And I saw at the bottom of the photograph, by the time I uh, had been notified it was up there, that Douglas Townsend had liked this photograph. So I thought, oh, well, maybe he's a member of the Philadelphia tango community I haven't heard of. <laughs> um, and I uh, promptly looked him up and saw that instead he was one of the most distinguished American composers of the century, and that uh, he had also had this distinguished career as a public intellectual, um, which immediately caught my eye. I found this out by reading a Wikipedia uh, biography on him. This caught my eye because I, at the time, had just left uh, what I thought was going to be an academic career, to pursue a career in opera, um, conducting and coaching on the one hand, but also I was very interested in maintaining my presence in Philadelphia as a lecturer, and I uh, figured that Douglas, with the long and distinguished career he had, might be a good person to talk to about this. So it was I at that point that reached out to him and said, um, would it be possible to meet up in New York? I'm, I'm there pretty frequently and uh, talk about um, this uh, kind of direction that I'm thinking of going in. And he wrote back right away within hours and said, yes, he would love to. And uh, we met at a diner again. It was a very specific diner he wanted to be at. Um, not far from here, as, as I recall. It was actually, no, near Carnegie Hall. Um, but uh, he and Jean uh, and I had lunch that day, and uh, you know, you've heard the stories from everybody today. It's, it was the same experience of really just feeling I'd met two wonderful people who were so genuine, so sincere, and so um, it genuinely interested in life. Um, and the conversations we had went above and beyond the purpose of meeting that day, which was really a you know, selfish reason on my part to just uh, look for career advice. The advice that Douglas gave me that day is hopefully still paying off, fingers crossed. It seems to be, uh, to be working and things are heading in the right direction. But I want to continue by talking a little bit about how uh, our relationship developed and how I came to be, to be speaking to you all today. Um, he came out to see me in the Bryant Park Fall Festival that fall. I was playing a tango concert with, again, with uh, Leonardo Suarez Paz. I'd been asked at very short notice to play, so I really wasn't expecting to see anybody uh, I knew there, even though the crowd was, was very large. And to my great surprise and pleasure, he appeared in the uh, green room tent and, um, and told me he'd, he'd come out all the way to hear this uh, performance. And I think it was in the weeks that uh, followed that he invited me to play at his second social networking concert. These were already underway. Uh, this time. The first one had happened earlier that year. Um, and I very gratefully accepted, and I was uh, performing a song cycle by Lydia Busla Blaze, who I know couldn't make it down today, but she was also a very uh, close Facebook friend of Douglas's. Um, Marianne Chazuli was one of my uh, performing partners that day. I was very happy to encounter her earlier intermission. Um, and then the following year, I specifically asked Douglas if I could play some of his music because I had heard it at that first uh, networking concert and I was really fascinated by um, certain aspects of it, which I'll go into it in a little bit. Um, so the, I played at the third uh, concert this earlier this year and it, it turned out to be a very special occasion for I think both of us because it was his sonatine number one 
which he had written in 1945. It was the first piece he had had a review from the New York Times for. And that was because Ray Lev, who was apparently at the time one of the best known pianists in town, had uh, premiered at uh, Carnegie Hall in the middle of a program with some other um, uh, very distinguished new works. And so starting to approach this piece was a real slice of history for me. Um, however, it stopped me falling into the same trap that Gene talked about at the beginning that so many musicians do, because I looked at the score and I thought, well, this is, looks like I can definitely fit this into my schedule this way, because it's, it's a fairly simple uh, you know, sonatina, not too long, and very transparent neoclassical counterpoint. I thought, yeah, this is, this is going to be fine. This is, I, I don't play solo piano too often anymore, but I thought it was going to be fine. It turned out this piece just ate up three evenings. I was practicing until two in the morning because once you unlock that door, open that Pandora's box, you get into that counterpoint and it just starts to make its own rules. I mean, Douglas's lines in this early work, he was only 22 years old, I believe, were just weaving off in all kinds of modulations that seemed wild, but they would always come back in the way that the best lines of Prokofiev do or Kulak do. They come back to a point where you realize that they couldn't really have happened any other way. There's always this retrospective sense that it makes. And so that made it doubly hard for me as a performer because you have all these unpredictable twists and turns and then you have to also bring them back and, and convey that sense to the audience. Um, so it ended up being a terrific challenge and one that by the time I got out there and played it, I thought that this is music that really asks the performer to step up to the plate and bring you know, the highest levels of concentration and dedication to it and it pays that off uh, pays you for that with uh, investment with such a wonderful artistic high and I'm sure everybody who's performed today can uh, testify to that as well. Um, what could be more inspiring than to hear the fantasy for American folk songs for piano duet? Are there any more inspiring pieces for piano duet out there that give you more of a sense that wow I really just want to sit down and do that? Um, and I think that, I mean a lot's been said about Douglas's character, that of course I agree with today, there's a lot's been said about his music that I agree with, uh, and his qualities. But I think for me, the overriding quality is that hand that he stretches out to a musician and asks us to come along on this journey with him. And he never abandoned performing musicians. He never went, fell into the trap of composing purely for academics. He never fell into the trap of composing for purely commercial reasons. He was always thinking about the experience of the people on stage. Um, and it's his ability to steer between those two 20th century traps um, that have snared so many composers, I feel, and stayed with the artists, and stayed, you know, they're holding our hands um, and inviting us to really look at life through his prism that was mirrored in his life on the street, on the subway, and of course on the social media. So we can guarantee if there are social media on the other side of the spiritual divide, where he'll be teaching uh, the other departed souls how to use it. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'd be one of the first ones to reach out to us if that ever happens. But uh, I, uh, I'm certainly very privileged to have got to know him uh, in the last two years of his life. And uh, like everyone else who spoke today, will carry these memories through my career. So thank you very much.